Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm sorry to start with technical difficulty, but very, very happy to be with you all tonight. Glad that you're tuning in to be with us. Um, I'm Patrice Moulton. I am the currently serving as the president for our Louisiana chapter, and we are very happy to be co-sponsoring our event tonight with the Fulbright Association, um, an evening of hope and through poetry. And we're looking forward to a wonderful evening together. And we hope that if you're here with us that you will take a moment to get on the chat right now and let us know who you are um, and where you are currently located. And if you have a, if you are a Fulbrighter, we'd like to know where and when you served in Fulbright as well. So if you'll take a moment and get on chat and do that for us, we would really appreciate it. And we are going to ask both Anne and Julie to put their information in the chat at some point for you as well, so that you can um, be in touch with them with questions or interactions later, if you would like. So with that, that being said, let me tell you that tonight our program is going to last about an hour and um, we have a few things to ask you to do. So we need to ask you to, if you have questions, um, comments, we'd like to ask you to use your um, question and answer uh, icon to be able to do that. And we'll keep up with your questions and we will answer anything that we can for you. So our first, just a moment, excuse me, sorry, <laughs> that technical di difficulty <laughs> everything around from where it was scheduled. So um, we're excited to be joined by our acclaimed Fulbright poets. Uh, Julie Kane and Ann Fisherworth, and they will be sharing their works tonight, focusing on resiliency of the human experience with us. Our first presenter is Julie Kane. She did her Fulbright in Lithuania in 2002. She is Professor Emeritus of English at Northwestern State University, which is also where I teach. Um, that's how Julie and I know each other, and we were lucky enough to be able to get this started by asking Judy to come join, Julie to come join us. She is a past Louisiana State Poet Laureate, and uh, most recently she has published her fifth book, which is titled Mother, Mothers of Ireland. So we look forward to listening to Julie share her works with us. Julie. Thank you so much for organizing this, Patrice, and thank you to the Fulbright Association and the Louisiana chapter for sponsoring it. And thank you to Fulbright for giving me that absolutely life-changing experience back in 2002. And I'm going to read for about 20 minutes. And I wanted to start with a couple of poems that were related to my time in Lithuania. The reason I got interested in applying for the Lithuania Fulbright um, was because back when Lithuania was still part of the Soviet Union in the late 1980s, I met um, several people from Lithuania. Uh, first of all, a journalist who was in this country. Um, he'd saved up some money and he was uh, touring jazz cities of the US. And he took one of my poetry books back to Lithuania to friends who were poets and gave it to um, one of them. And she and I started corresponding and trying to get each other translated and published. And they came to the US and visited me. So um, I had this you know, friendship going and I was interested in the country for a long time before I actually went there. And I'm gonna start out with this poem called Cold War Flashback that I wrote um, after one of my friends had been in the country. If you remember, Lithuania was really the country that, um, the little bitty country that challenged the Soviet Union and their um, drive for independence helped to bring down the Iron Curtain. But um, this is about the incident before that happened when Soviet tanks um, tried to put down a rebellion in the capital city and um, crushed a whole crowd of people near the TV tower in Vilnius, killing, I think, 14 people and, and, and injuring hundreds of others. And I was worried because my friend had a TV program and um, I was very worried about him. So this is Cold War flashback. The hostess gifts you brought me were a joke, a photograph of Lenin in a small red star to pin to my lapel, assorted postcards featuring the worst in Soviet art, factories, 
tractors. We laughed so hard we hiccuped. Later that night, we passed the kitschy gift shops on Bourbon Street. I bought you a souvenir hurricane glass. Then you were gone, and my morning paper lay on the stoop in a cellophane bag, as if not bringing it in could alter the, the news of the movement of Soviet tanks. I blinked back tears at the Lenin pin. I kissed that icon as the tanks rolled in. And when I finally did get to Lithuania, I had just assumed that I was going to pick up Lithuanian because I've been pretty good at languages most of my life. But what I discovered is that nobody just picks up Lithuanian. Lithuanian is the closest living language to ancient Sanskrit. And I remember one time when um, my colleagues at Vilnius Pedagogical University who were Lithuanian all spoke, you know, at least five languages. And I one time asked one of them which one had been the most difficult to learn, fully expecting her to say English. And she said, Lithuanian. She was not kidding. <laughs> so anyhow, this is, I don't speak Lithuanian. To move to another country and not speak the language, unable to tell where words start and end in that river of speech sounds, except when your name is spoken or cake or some number one to 10, is to be reborn as a one-year-old child or a dog in the corner, its paws on its snout, an astronaut drifting through galaxy static, or blind Helen Keller, her hand in the spout. Like that day in your childhood when millions of ladybugs covered your swing set, the sides of your house, events appear to be conjured by magic when you don't have the language to ask why or how so that you almost dread the day some chatter locks like a virus to ports in gray matter. And one more from that time. Um, the thing about having a Fulbright is you're gone for six months or a year and life goes on back home without you. And when you came, come back, things are different. This is called Cardinal. This time last winter, I abandoned you, or rather left you in the hands of God and college kids demolishing my house while I was teaching poetry abroad. My last day home, you came to feed at dusk, your habit, bird of shadows, too exposed in undiluted sunlight, malformed wing draped rakishly as a dandy's cloak. And though back home again, I look for you, I know deep down that was the final time. What else was I to do? Not go? Take you? To cage a songbird is a federal crime. The yard is full of birds whose wings are whole, but I can't recognize a single soul. And because of my friendship with Lithuanian poets and my time in Lithuania, I wound up um, together with poet H.L. Hicks translating a volume of selected poems by the Lithuanian poet Tatvita Marcin Kevichute. We, um, we co-edited the volume and uh, we and some other poets worked you know, with several versions of literal translations of the poems. And then because I've known Tatvita all her life and know, you know the details of her personal life and Lithuanian history and culture, you know, it was, um, it was easier to, you know, to make poems out of those very rough versions. So this is by Tatvita Marcin Kevichute. It's a prose poem. It's called The Diamond Mine. And it's really poignant to me now at a time when we really miss being close to our friends, hugging our friends and being around our friends, which we will again, I'm sure. How difficult it is to part with friends. The endless conversation still running like a fire truck at full speed, their cigarette butts burning in the ashtray. You linger a moment before beginning to wash the cups of just evaporated coffee, hoping to evoke an illusion of their presence from the cup rings warmed by their lips, words like squirrels jumping from lips to the branches of ears. You must see them, enjoy their nimbleness and grace, try in vain to cuddle with them, even the son, already dressed in his school uniform, chases them until the last minute, risking being late again. Yes, 
it is still possible to trick them into sitting down at the table again to command their full attention so that they forget the grandiose projects of the day into which they will soon be plunging and laughing until tears form. Suddenly you feel yourself to be the richest person in the world, strewn with the amethysts of their hearts and the emeralds of their minds, understanding that friendship is the greatest of all diamond mines. And let's see, I have some couple of early poems that I thought were hopeful. This one is titled Prayer to Chaos. And by that, I meant not, not really chaos, but um, just um, hope that our fates are not predestined, that they're not fixed, that we can make choices that change things. This is Prayer to Chaos. Let the universe be random. Let no choreographer impose design on the dance of atoms. Let the stars prophecies, the old dead light, skew past our lives. If the lines on the palms of our hands be light charts, let them swerve like rivers when we touch. No, not touch, collide. And another one from that time period, my very first book, um, it's called Reasons for Loving the Harmonica, but I think what it's really about is the resilience of the human spirit. Reasons for Loving the Harmonica. Because it isn't harmonious, because it gleams like the chrome on a 57 Chevy's front grille, because it fits in a hobo's bandana, because it tolerates spit, a little spit, means the music is fervent because it's easily rigged to a contraption that frees the human hands, because it's cynical yet sings, because it sings breathing in. And a little one um, spider lilies. I don't know if they grow in other parts of the country. But in Louisiana, um, they pop up in late September or early October um, with red flowers and no leaves. Some people call them naked ladies because they don't have any leaves on them. And um, there's a little church near here, which is the oldest African-American church in the country, built by African-Americans in the country. And when you go there, um, you see these flowers that people have tucked into the into the cracks in the statues, you know, as, as kind of a form of prayer. This is spider lilies. After the first rain in October, they spring up in straight rows around houses and grave plots. Something in their DNA craves a human drawn line to follow, like grade school children writing their names on a ruled page. Up close to, they look more like kids' toys and real flowers, red plastic pinwheels fastened to green wooden sticks with not one long leaf among them. And in their centers where you'd expect to find sexual organs and sticky gold pollen is only nothingness like the crotch of a doll. Yet when I go to the poor Creole church at Isle Brevel this time of autumn for their fair, it's not the store-bought aster nor the rich man's rose that I find tucked in the plaster folds of Mary's dress with the child's hope. And this poem, Plea Bargain, came about because I'm sure like um, many of us here, I went through a very serious illness. I, I had cancer um, years ago and for a long time afterward or I guess about five years afterward you know there, there was that danger zone for recurrence where every time you have a scan you're just you know scared out of your wits. This is plea bargain. Inside the scanner's tunnel you swear that you will be a candidate for sainthood if spared from a big C. You'll help to feed the hungry, you'll comfort the bereft, You'll minister to lepers if there are any left. But when the doctors tell you that you are in the pink, the terms that you agreed to seem rather harsh 
you think. Perhaps another kitten, a shelter rescue pet, or pound of fair trade coffee would settle up the debt. Okay, and I've got one more, if I can find my book, ah, yes. This is Thornhedge Villanelle. And um, Villanelle is a very old French form with two lines that kind of keep weaving in and out like braiding hair. And the poem's about how um, when one person recovers from alcohol or addiction, often that can kind of spark you know, others to, you know, to follow suit. There's sort of a chain reaction. I was thinking with that thorn hedge, I was thinking of <laughs> the fairy tale Sleeping Beauty, where when she falls into that sleep for a hundred years, a thorn hedge grows up around the village and everything in the village is just sort of frozen and suspended animation. So this is thorn hedge, Villanelle. Is getting sober like the act it takes to free a kingdom from a magic spell? The thorn hedge crumbling as the sleepers wake and century old bread begins to bake and dogs scratch fleas and horses jingle bells with you there marveling, that's all it takes? Ex-students text you their sobriety dates who used to workshop blackout villanelles. Oh, what a miracle to see them wake to sweet lives free of vomit and the shakes. You unkissed liquor and a thorn hedge fell. One bumbling action, all it ever takes. And at the risk of sounding like a flake, you wonder if the genes inside a cell can mend themselves when family members wake. The latest news about your cousin makes four in your generation spared the hell that took your elders as a thorn hedge takes a kingdom where all die before they wake. And I'm gonna wind up with two kind of hopeful love poems. The first one about a relationship that's actually been over for a long time, but you know, but there's still something there. Particle physics. And if there are any uh, Fulbright physicists out there, I, I hope I got this right. Particle physics. They say two photons fired through a slit stay paired together to the end of time. If one is polarized to change its spin, the other does a U-turn on a dime, although they fly apart at speeds of light and never cross each other's paths again, like us, a couple in the 70s divorced for almost 30 years since then. Tonight, a Red Sox batter homer twice to beat the Yankees in their playoff match. And sure as I was born in Boston, when that second ball deflected off the bat, I knew your thoughts were flying back to me, though your location was a mystery. And I'll end with one in the new book. This is As If another little sonnet. As if the corpse behind the crime scene tape got up and took a bow where it dropped dead. As if I got a phone call from the grave and asked its occupant to share my bed. Nine years ago, we fought and split apart with our beloved city underwater. I turned to short-term lovers in the dark you moved in with a Southern judge's daughter. I have to pinch myself to prove you're back, though balder, 10 pounds thinner, better dressed, as if the universe had jumped a track. No hurricane, no choices second guessed. At times, my ears pick up the strangest sounds, as if the dead were clapping underground. And thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, I just want to remind everybody, your work is amazing, Julie. And I want to remind everybody that if you have questions or comments, your questions go in the question and answer. And if you have comments, please let us know. Um, I will tell you, Julie, that the lines, it's interesting to me kind of what 
speaks to each one of us. And the line that really stuck with me, um, many beautiful lines, but the line that really stuck with me was out of the reasons to love the harmonica was because it tolerates a little spit. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess I'm just feeling like in 2020, we're all tolerating more than a little spit. And, but I think we're doing it well overall. And I think one of the reasons I'm so proud to be a Fulbrighter is to be a part of this community and to be an active part of this community of resilient people, even when we're tolerating a little spit. <laughs> so thank you so much um, for that. And if any of you would like to um, say something in the chat or in the, the question and answers about, you know, what's speaking to you, I'm sure that Julie and Anne would love that feedback and would love to hear it um, as, as part of our community to anyone that's listening. So thank you again. Um, we're going to move to our next presentation and we are really, really lucky to have Ann Fisherworth with us to do the second part of our program tonight. Anne has been a senior Fulbright in Switzerland and she has held the Fulbright Chair of Distinguished Studies in Sweden. She is currently at the University of Mississippi and she recently has published her sixth book, The Bones of Winter Birds. And thank you so much for being with us tonight. We look forward to listening. <clears throat> thank you. I am so delighted to be here. And I'm so grateful to Fulbright. I had two incredibly wonderful Fulbright experiences. So I recommend that everybody should apply and take advantage of this wonderful program. Um, so I'm gonna start with a poem for one of the most wonderful things in my life, which is becoming a grandmother. And this was written before my first grandchild was born, but it's also dedicated to all the rest of them as well. It's called What Boat? What boat now brings you out of darkness into the swoop of barn swallows? We say the swallows are rejoicing because if we could dart and shimmer and dive and soar as they do, skimming the air, we would be rejoicing as in this noontime thinking of you, daughter, son, or daughter, daughter, I am rejoicing. You rode in her when she curled in me. You are big as a berry now with a beating heart. Grasses flow heavy with seed. Queen Anne's lace spreads its snowy mantles where sunlight warms the wood that warms my back. This bright and swimming world will soon be yours. Pollen, thistle down, hills to the sea in fog below me. Red winged blackbirds whistling, child. Sun drunk flies bumbling, buzzing. And the next poem is called Credo. I figured at some point in my life, I should try to write about what I think art comes from. Credo, but the cardinal, the bird song do not need you to pulse forward into the light. The peaches do not need you to swell and soften dark with the sugars of summer. Oh, you can be the flesh their juices run down, but you do not make the seed nor the earth it grows in. And the artist, what is she? The one whose hands are empty, who says, though to what I do not know, speak through me as you will, who calls the made thing out of the sheltering darkness. Now the day is full of leaves. After the rain, the sky is low and white as ash, the ragged garden spikes and trembles. I'm going to read now several poems from <clears throat> that time in Sweden, which was just so lovely. I taught at Uppsala University and right across from the English department was a huge cemetery, beautiful with big stone markers and spruce trees and fir trees and 
Um, that was where people who'd been associated with the university could be buried. So one day I saw uh, uh, an engraving on a stone marker that moved me so much. And my accent is really bad, but here's what it said. Snapped Jaeger Stormen Vora Or. Suddenly a storm hunted down our year. A headstone in a graveyard, Uppsala, Sweden. Suddenly a storm hunted down our year. And when I raised my head from the table, every leaf lay in the grass. <clears throat> The grass dazzled. In that piercing blue silence, a door stayed open, holding its breath. Blunt shoes, still with mud on them, stood in the closet. You hear the quiet voices everywhere. He was a good husband. She was a good sister. When my first child died, I then the phone rang, they said, come, Herr Olsen has fallen. They are not a people who show feelings. You ask them how it goes. Mogom, they say, it means just enough. Is how they want their lives to spin steadily off the skein of new milky wool. It's how they smile at April's sticky leaves, how they walk by the Furious River each May, photographing the king's blood lilies. You will not see when they lose everything. And I wrote a whole book that year called Carta Marina, which is based on an incredible map at the Carolina Rodaviva, the great library at Uppsala University. The Carta Marina is the oldest geographically accurate map of the Northern lands, but it's also full of strange beings, you know, trolls and goblins and <clears throat> whales with spouts and horns and all kinds of things. Um, and this book ends up being kind of like a novel in poetry. It takes the form of a day book. So the different poems don't have titles, they just have dates. And I'm going to read you a couple of these. One thing that I loved a lot about Sweden was the incredible changes in light between summer and winter. Being in Mississippi, it's a lot more kind of even business, but I became just entranced by the darkness of winter. So this is from December 18th. We lived in an apartment high above a city street. And um, here's this. They tell me that in the old times, people would light candles and just sit in the dark, resting, being in the dark. And so I have lit candles and the Uppsala spreads around me and the ink and music weaves up from the street where three men are playing, collecting coins in a hat on the ground. And though I hear the buses and sometimes clanking, in what my husband once called this soulless apartment. Here is the shining dark. We have not solved the problem of love, have we? My small paper city waves its banners and candlelight glints and gleams on its red foil towers, its gold and emerald windows, its silver domes and star shield. The candles by the window are flickering on the table, calm and seeking upward. They are like breath that barely hovers at the threshold of the body. And far different from April, April, shortly before we came home. So this is like a saying goodbye poem. Only a few weeks left. I am starting to say goodbye to Kung Kral anniversary restaurant where we ate steak dripping with bloody juices and slathered in bernas and cress and oyster mushrooms and the best fries in Sweden. Goodbye to yellow finches, to laughing gulls that throng the park near the Fogelsong Cafe, to jackdaws in peppery clouds around the Domkirken, huge messy magpie nests and magpies prancing 
their bottle green sheen and preen. Goodbye to the pump hosted where in spring rushes the thawing furious river. And Santorini, the restaurant on the river, goodbye to its moussaka, Zivlaki, the waitress six feet tall with towering hair and skin tight clothes. Goodbye to her slow eyes, her slink and grin, the icy glasses of Retsina. Goodbye to Swedish throwing up sickness, that's what they really call it, that I got after eating that moussaka and Peter held my head all night. Goodbye to five days of weakness and misery. Goodbye to the cobblestones, the paving stones. Goodbye, Slutspurt, our first Swedish words. Tilbaka and Taksumukit, Urshekta, or so good, Svartsuk, Bitterlyuva, and my favorites, Svamp and Schickling. Goodbye to our bed with its feather bed and to making love to the cries of seagulls. Goodbye to the Swedish sun after endless gray and the students singing each Saturday night in the streets below our apartment and the happy shouts and crashing bottles. And goodbye to the most beautiful roof in the world, old terracotta scallop tiles light kissed with wavy striations of shadow and channels of shadow vertically bare trunk and branches of a linden tree cutting up across the corner of the roof, a pattern of shadows flung down the rock, down across the roof, and a little black ventilation pipe sitting up partway along. This is the roof I have gazed at all year at my office window while riding through snow and gray and now brilliant blue, now light lichens and dirt, add another layer of smudge and blur and time, a roughness, a texture, a patina. So since the pandemic began, for a while there I was writing poems. They don't have titles, they just are called by the day on which I wrote them. And the whole series is called The Days, and I'd like to read two of them to you now. Day 59. See how quickly it has changed. Without people, the sky is clean again, and all day long birds clamor and music. I'm on my deck in my underwear, star for sunlight. A woodpecker drills at a telephone pole, and two cardinals dive bomb each other through the privet a world empty <clears throat> of people, just uninterrupted grass, Lawrence wrote a hundred years ago, and a hare sitting up, ready to bound, alert and quivering. Nowhere to go, nothing to do, the monks and nuns sing, standing in a circle beneath the trees at Magnolia Grove, Thich Nhat Hanh's monastery in Mississippi. And today, I'd like to sit with Sister Boy and Sister Peace, eat vegetables and tofu, then wash my bowl in the series of pans, dirty water, soapy water, rinse water, clear, clear like this sky, like the breeze in which the daylight swims. A robin flies to the maple tree. Day 32, just sec. <clears throat> Day 32, a young stag at dusk, white tail flicking, eating flowers heaped on a raw grave, <clears throat> raises his head to watch us before he vanishes slowly into the trees. Outside the kitchen window, my peace rose rides on arching stems like moons in a lead white sky. My all year earth holds them. I ignore them. Night thickens among the branches of ginkgo, maple, willow oak, cherry, 
red bud and the thicket of bamboo that surround this wooden house. Sometimes I am afraid. At three, I knelt on the back seat of my mother's car and looking out the window, I said, there's so much to see and so little time to see it. It's like that now, watching the leaves. Bread rises in the oven. May the stag sink back into the forest. May the petals drop on the grass. Whoever you are, may you be at peace in this great silence where only the birds speak. So I'd like to read two more poems. One, the only poem really that I wrote in Switzerland. Um, and I just need to say a little bit about this, first of all, read a little note about it. It's called For Anyone For You. And the note is this, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca was treasurer of the Narvaez expedition in 1528, which attempted to conquer Florida with 400 men. All but four died in a series of disasters. Cabeza de Vaca wandered through Northern Mexico until 1536, traveling from tribe to tribe. And in his solitude, he discovered that he had healing powers which disappeared once he was reunited with the Spanish. So the line <laughs> that I quote in the poem is from Hanaya Long's interlinear translation of Cabeza de Vaca's Naufragios. And Hanaya Long's um, book is called The Power Within. He was a Quaker during World War II. I've practiced yoga for decades and I had some training in healing disciplines like Reiki. And so um, that's probably what this poem is about too. For anyone, for you. You roll your burdensome days to the top of the mountain, then walk home through the crowded city streets full of the ache you know, the small lines around your eyes guarding against your <clears throat> humiliation. Come to my table and drink my wine. Then I will cook for you veal paprikash on thick blue plates and aromatic rice and slivers of blood oranges. We will talk as we wait for night, watching the shadows grow, the sun as it burns vermilion. It is so little that I offer. Is it all that I can give you? Did I, becoming sage, give up the power that I once had? One year the fire ran down my arms from the awakened chakras and my hands on the delicate spines knew what they were doing. Your Majesty, Cabeza de Vaca wrote, encounters have become my meditation. From long crossing on the desert, all his safety burned away and he found that he could heal. With blind tenderness, he stretched forth his baffled, sunstruck fingers. When I was young, I knew touch was holy. Delicate small bone spines of the bodies of strangers. I was the lost and found. You could park your grief and rise up new and radiant in me as those whom Cabeza de Vaca touched turned away into the desert blossoming. And I'll end with a poem called When You Come to Love, written for a wedding. But for all of us, when you come to love, bring all you have. Bring the milk in the jug, the checked cloth on the table, the conch that sang the sea when you were small, and your moonstone rings, your dream of wolves, 
your woven bracelets. For the key to love is in the fire's nest and the riddle of love is the hawk's dropped feather. Bring every bowl and ewer, every cup and chalice, jar, for love will fill them all. And dazzled with the day, fold the sunlight in your sheets, fold the smell of salt and leaves, of summer, sweat, and roses, to shake them out when you need them most, for love is strong as death. So thank you, thanks very much. And thank you so much for sharing with us. It was just, just beautiful. Um, I'll tell you things that, the words that really rang to me um, in your poems were, in your poetry, was that encounters have become my meditation. I think we're all hungry for encounters with people, um, hugs to come back and, and things to be a bit more normal. And uh, that really spoke to me. So thank you for that. Um, and also whoever you are, may you be at peace in this great silence in this time. And I hope that we all find ways to do that. And by being parts of a community that comes together, um, even like this evening, I think we're in the process of doing that. So I'm glad we can all share this evening together for an hour. Um, our time is, is nearing the end and we had asked if you had um, any questions or ans questions that we that our panelists might answer for us. So Julie, there you are back with us. Mm -hmm. um, so we have just one question here so far and it is from Kate Dobson and uh, she says, Julie and Ann, your poems are beautiful, thank you. I'm inspired to write a few about my Fulbright experience. I've long thought about this, but keep stopping myself because I don't feel I know what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> as most of us feel much of the time. Um, any tips on getting started for someone with no training in poetry and whose Fulbright was several years ago? So any, any words of wisdom for Fulbrighters or others who might be wanting to bring their experiences to life? Well, so I just wonder if when you were there, you were keeping notes or scribbling or whatever, you know. Um, I think that it's always hard to remember things after the fact. And yet at the same time, some things just last so much in the memory. So I guess I would suggest as a way to get started that you um, just free associate. Here's something that I do with students a lot and it always works is give them a time to free write for 20 minutes and give them a trigger phrase. And your trigger phrase could be something like, I remember when, um, and you just write that down and then you start writing without stopping. You're not allowed to stop. You're not allowed to cross anything out. You're not allowed to, you know, say, oh, this is bad. You don't worry about spelling. You don't worry about neatness. You just write. And anytime you get stuck, <clears throat> instead of holding still, you just go right back to writing down that trigger phrase again. I remember when. And without judging, you're just collecting material. So that's something that I would suggest as a way to get started because um, you know, that, that kind of tricks this anxiety about, oh gosh, I don't know what to say and whatever, whatever. Just the time free write. It always works. I've done it a ton with students and they always come up with the most amazingly wonderful things. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. I think it's really important to have um, a community too, you know, when you're, when you're writing poetry and it's hard these days with COVID, but if, um, it's important, you know, to try to read poetry and you can subscribe to, there are a number of um, websites that'll send you a poem a day or have a poem a day and you get a big sampling of all different kinds of poets, you know, so you're bound to find something that you, you know, that you're really resonating with, like um, Poetry Daily and Verse Daily and the Writer's Almanac and Rattle Poem a Day and uh, Academy of American Poets Poem a Day. And then, um, you can seek out, there are lots of poetry reading on Zoom, you know, if you go on Facebook, but, you know, just, you know, to kind of remind yourself that, you know, there are lots of people out there, you know, writing and, and, and trying to, you know, put those experiences to words. 
you know, like you. And, you know, maybe when, you know, when times get a little bit better, you know, I'd actually look for a little community writing group to join, you know, where you can bring your rough drafts and see other people's rough drafts and realize that, you know, everybody's in that same boat, you know, <laughs> of just, um, you know, struggling with that blank page and, and trying, you know, trying to get the words down and get them right. It, it really helps to have others, you know, with you, I think, in that, in that journey. Yeah. And, you know, don't worry too much about that being done before you start. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's yeah. like, just think, okay, I'm just writing stuff down. I'm just trying to remember what I can. I'm playing around. Um, think in terms of your senses. What did things smell like? What did things taste like? Maybe what were some recipes that you learned or describe somebody's face, you know? And it's just mm -hmm. like, just collecting information, just yeah. collect sensory details. Um, and then eventually see where that goes, you know? Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it helps too to imagine who you would be writing this to, you know, who, who you would want this to read this, you know, and, and write for them, you know, as if as if it's just one on one, you know, you to them. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Write a letter. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, kind of I mean, my book Carter Marina really was it really just kind of took the form of a of a day book. Mm -hmm. um, and I had no idea where it was gonna go. Just absolutely none. So I was sort of writing forward as I was living forward, you know? Um, yeah. Another thing I like to do is write with my non-dominant hand. Oh. Because that way you're tapping into the other side of your brain, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, it's really awkward, but it can be really pretty cool. You come up with some stuff that you never, ever, ever could have dreamed up. Wow, yeah. <laughs> I'm being photobombed by a cat. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye, <Diane. laughs> um, so guys, I'm being told that we have a question for Julie that is in the chat, Shaz is telling me, and that it is regarding Hurricane Katrina. But I do not have access. Oh, I think I saw asking if that, that last poem was about Hurricane Katrina. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. And God, now there are several other hurricanes that have hit poor Lake Charles and the surrounding communities in Louisiana. So, yeah, all over again. Yeah, a, a, lot, a lot of things to um, cope with. But yeah. overall, I think people's resiliency is outweighing the stressors. I continue exactly. to yeah. say, bring it, that yeah. we've got this. Um, <laughs> so, um, and someone else has just asked is that poem published in your new book, Julie. Oh, as if yes, it is in the new book. Yeah. And it also it made it into Best American Poetry. What was the year? 2014, 2016, or something like that, too, I think. Wonderful. All right, guys. Well, if there are no further questions at this time, I'd like to remind, um, I'll take just a few minutes to close up. I would like to ask Anne and Julie to please make sure you put any professional contact information that you would like okay. to in the chat so we go so that people have further questions. And I will tell you after that last question and the answers, um, it makes me start to have ideas about the possibility of maybe a, um, you know, uh, somebody else just said it, maybe a future book chat or maybe um, from, from people or maybe even a poetry workshop um, online as a community one night for a, a, a period of time might be an interesting thing at some time at some point for for us to try. Um, we will be bringing I'd like to thank you both so much again for spending your time and sharing your gifts with us and providing a sense of um, resiliency and hope for us and I would like to thank the Fulbright Association tonight for partnering with us to make this possible and supporting the event and for all the participants who have logged in to spend some time with us tonight. And as our time comes to a close, I would just like to remind you all that if you are Fulbright alumni, um, we'd like for you to be an active part of the association with us. Please consider joining us and being a part of us with the Fulbright Association. And I encourage you all, if um, whether you're Fulbright or whether you're friends of Fulbright and you support 
foreign exchange and growth of communities through relationships built. I hope that you'll join us in your uh, local chapters. We certainly would welcome you in the Louisiana chapter and would love to have you be a part of us. You know, we Louisianans are really welcoming and, and warm, <laughs> the more the merrier for us. So we'd love to have you be a part of us if you'd like to and happy to share information about that with you. Um, I just wanna thank the Fulbright community for working so hard to build a better tomorrow. Um, for our communities both here and abroad, um, regardless of whether times are rough or whether times are the best of times. And I say here's looking forward uh, to a 2021 with hope. And I hope you all enjoyed your evening. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye bye. Thanks.